Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Matt, how you doing? Excellent. Ready to attack the news cycle. Good. We're short on time, but we're full of stories, so we'll jump right into it. We got a nice slate for everyone. We're going to first start off with the Biden chip ban, talk about the implications for the ASIC market, going to dive into Rhodium's new numbers that they released, and then we're going to talk about Celsius mining in core, so duking it out in court, and Riot expanding Navarro. Seemingly mostly positive, but a little local pushback, which has, of course, happened for a lot of miners moving into different regions of the U.S. Let's kick it off with some Biden chip ban. Give me the lay of the land for this story. Definitely important for a lot of people in electronic space. Yeah, I think the the Biden administration, part of their strategy is they want to keep their semiconductors at home. So this story essentially came out um, to where they unveiled part of their strategy. And the key points are that um, they kind of want the semiconductor industry workers to come home that are currently working in China. And then they don't want to send the cutting edge chips, those five nanometer, seven nanometer chips over to China. And so if you think about impact on the um, Bitcoin mining space, it could be that manufacturers in China um, can't get their chips and can't maybe produce as much. Um, but I know you have some color on this one, so I'm going to send it back over to you. Yeah, first, seeing a story, you're like, oh, this is not good for the ASIC industry because a lot of ASIC manufacturers were formerly very centralized in China, but luckily that has changed over the last two years pretty drastically. So we have Bitmain and we have MicroBT. Those make up probably 90% of the ASIC marketplace, maybe even a little bit more. And both of those teams work through different foundries to procure their chips, notably TSMC, which is based out of Taiwan with Bitmain, and then Samsung for MicroBT, which is located in South Korea. A lot of the machines were then assembled in China, especially in like Shanghai and those sort of areas. But that's not really the case anymore. Luckily, Bitmain and MicroBT really saw through this a while ago and made some strategic moves. A lot of both their operations are actually now based in Malaysia and Indonesia, a few other locations in Southeast Asia. That's where they're putting these machines together. So if you get an ASIC nowadays, that's commonly where it's manufactured. I still believe that there's a lot of like a Chinese presence in terms of the teams for Bitmain. Like they're still dominated by uh, the Chinese industry. So like distribution is there probably some like packaging and maybe some light manufacturing. But to my knowledge, a lot of the core components of ASICs are now built outside of China because China has taken such an aggressively anti-Bitcoin stance. So good play for Bitmain, good play for MicroBT. The remaining question is like for these other ASIC manufacturers, uh, did they get out in time? Were they able to get out in time? My knowledge, it's out of those two a little tough like they still might have a lot of their industries still based in china yeah i think general we're finding out more net positives that came out of the china ban last year which was like kind of scary at the time i think um for a lot of people when they when news first broke but you know bitcoin mining space not just getting more decentralized less concentrated in china on a hash rate level but also on a asic production level so good things all around there yeah, we'll see what the uh, end result of this is. Of course, there's always like long-term repercussions no one's sure of. But for the most part, it seems like a pretty strategic lateral move by both of those large manufacturers. Let's move over to Rhodium. Rhodium is a very large private Bitcoin miner. They just went public or are going, about to go public. You can provide more details for us. Uh, but we got new information from a recent filing from that team. Yeah, so filing a couple of days ago happened. They're going through a SPAC deal with Silver Sun Technologies. But uh, a bit of a shocker in this news is that Rhodium's a little bit bigger than uh, many people may have anticipated. Got some numbers here. Um, they have 3.6 X hash per second of hash rate capacity. That puts them sixth behind um, core scientific self mining, is, is 13. Marathon, I got 5.7. Riot just behind at 5.6. Bitfarms, CleanSpark, and then Rhodium. So yeah, pretty significant operations coming out of Rhodium. We have more hash rate under sort of the purview of the SEC and US regulatory bodies, which um, may not be that great, but from a data perspective and our insight into the industry gives us a bit more transparency. Um, so one or two more other things to note, they sold just about all the BTC they produced 
um, in the second half of this year, 2,747 Bitcoin to be exact, which at today's price is around 52 million. They also sold a bunch of what's miners, 2,600 what's miners over the summer, contributing to some of the downfall in ASIC markets, um, which was sort of already distressed beforehand, right? From the, the overproduction of manufacturers, one sort of demand, um, I can't think, sunk a little bit once the, the market turned over in uh, how inviting mining economics was from last year to this year. Your thoughts? Yeah, the interesting thing to me is that Rhodium is actually a pretty large hosted client inside Riot's facility in Rockdale. So it's interesting to see like a large miner built on the backs of someone else. I mean, there's a few other people out there, including Compass, that that's basically their model, right? Marathon, another one, that they're able to use a hosted model and then grow their own hash rate by using infrastructure for other players. And then that gets into some curious and interesting thoughts about how everyone is basically a competitor against each other in the Bitcoin network. You're all vying for the same Bitcoin, but you end up using the same infrastructure. Um, just a little curious about that. Uh, the Rhodium news itself, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think they tried to go public like earlier last year, but didn't quite work out. The timing wasn't great. And now they're going public. And so we got some great new data from this team. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it, seeing some more, some more reporting. To me, eh, not the most interesting story quite yet, but I think there's more stuff to come. To add to what you said, not just vying for the same physical infrastructure, but also vying for the same capital in some instances. Um, something that also showed up in their filing was that they had a their major recent loan from NYDIG, which we know a lot of the public list and miners um, also have loans from NYDIG and uh, Galaxy Digital, one of the other major ones as well. Totally, totally. So we'll see what happens with the Rhodium team. Best of luck as they go public. Let's move over to Celsius Mining and Core Scientific. We have a new headline from the Wall Street Journal that came out, I believe, yesterday, October 20th. Yeah, we're recording this Friday, October 21st. So according to the new Wall Street Journal article, Crypto Miner Core Scientific flags threat from Celsius Chapter 11 dispute. Essentially, the argument here is that Celsius owes Core Scientific for unpaid hosting and Celsius mining. Oh, they might not have the funds. Who knows? It's Chapter 11. It's a little curious. We also have some information from Core, Scientific, Core Scientific's recent S1 that they filed in early September, talking about like basically all of their financial operations. And Celsius definitely was named within the documents. So that they were owed about 0.9 million dollars from Celsius uh, due to operations, and that remains unpaid. I think Celsius wants their machines, from what I understand, and Core Scientific wants their money. Uh, so we'll see this play out. The thing I want to bring up in this though is like this is a nice headline dispute, like it made it into the Wall Street Journal, but this is not that much money according to the S1 filings, like. 0.9 million, that might sound a lot to like a pleb miner or you know, to me and you, but it's not a lot to these large firms. According to Core Scientific's S1, they have 1.05 billion in operating losses and an operating income of 15.5 million for the first three months, ending June 30th of 2022 and 2021. So, you know, this is like very small for Core Scientific. The amount of assets they have in the books close to 500 million and the amount of liabilities is certainly up there as well with the amount of funding they've taken out. So this is sort of a small amount of money. I'm curious why it made it such a big headline, but it did. Yeah. I mean, it, as far as the Celsius story goes, it sounds like Core Scientific may have some bigger problems operating at a loss, right? Like they are. Um, I think it goes to show that a lot of these public listed miners, perhaps in the bull market, a lot of people were like, yay, they're doing so great. But it turns out they have kind of higher cost structures than uh, anyone may have anticipated, likely overhead and specifically um, energy costs, right? And we're seeing that sort of on the hosting level, but core scientific likely on the self-mining level as well. Everyone is sort of vying for those same scarce um, Bitcoin rewards, Bitcoin block rewards, right? But they have to each have their own individual cost structures. Um, and a lot of the public listed miners have a lot of overhead. And, you know, in this story, particularly some legal fees coming out of it too, as there's sort of a recess playground fight between Celsius and Core Scientific right now going, no, you said 
that you were going to um, charge me this much. And then, no, you said you were going to pay me this much. And so it's back and forth litigation battle that will probably continue to follow and cover in the coming weeks. Yeah, some of our mining analyst stuff that we have on Mining Memo, our newsletter shows that Core Scientific is actually dead last in terms of miner valuation for the 11 miners that we look at. In terms of cost per pentahash for mining operations, they're about $105,000 per machine. So this is basically taking the aggregate purchases of machines to date and a little bit more information and then doing a breakdown per pentahash. And it's certainly high. It's not the highest. Uh, I think Marathon Digital is the highest with $174,000 per pentahash. But Core is definitely up there. Uh, and they've taken on a lot of debt, from my understanding, to be able to do this. Their net assets, again, are just around $500 million in net assets as of now. Uh, but their rankings of debt versus assets puts them in the lower tiers of miner. So we're curious to see what happens with this. Uh, Core Scientific is the largest miner in North America. And you know, only one good bull run away from you know, getting back on top. Dominant miner during 2020 and 2021 made a lot of smart moves. But I am curious with seeing them in the headlines more and more how they pivot out of this and what they do next. We don't have enough information to really say if they're really in a bad spot. I mean, there's some other miners that are definitely in a very tough spot. I won't name them so uh, they get too upset. But there's definitely a few miners I can think of off the top of my head that are like in the, the lowest spots of the, the Bitcoin rankings right now, the Bitcoin miner rankings. I'm not comfortable enough saying Core is there yet, but it's definitely something to consider, something to watch. Let's move on to the last topic for today. Riot expanding to Navarro with a new one gigawatt site. They broke ground on that this week. Pretty interesting story to see them continue to expand, especially during a bear market. I hand it off to you, Matt. Yeah, I mean, to me, obviously, major story, one gigawatt is huge, right? And Texas growing more. They have this deal with ERCOT. They're doing some innovative stuff like immersion cooling um, in some of their buildings rather than uh, the air cooling, right? Which is sort of a popular um, sort of newer thing in the last couple of years of the mining space that has you know a lot of potential as far as like overclocking and things like that go. But I think generally, I don't think to me that huge of a story. A lot of the large scale miners and the public listed miners are expanding at the moment. The fact that they're just breaking ground, it's not energized with machines coming online quite yet, doesn't have a major immediate impact. But of course, down the line for Riot, this is you know a big story. One gigawatt, they're, they're going to get a lot of hash rate out of that power draw. Um, and so it'll be interesting to follow. We'll see how big they get. We will see. There's some nice local reporting about this groundbreaking as well. Some people are frustrated with Riot coming to town because it's so large. And we have seen pushback in some of these localities around the United States saying like, these things are too loud, they're noisy, uh, I don't know, maybe pollutants, whatever else. Like there's always some sort of like local parks and rec sort of take against these Bitcoin mining operations. Some of them are good. Like they shouldn't be so close to neighborhoods. These, these facilities are very loud. They should be industrially zoned. Some of them are pretty bad uh this navarro one seems like a big boost for local economy with and the local digital or the local commerce department rather excuse me has already embraced right moving to the region uh one other little factoid that's interesting about this is that uh, this is the largest uh, okay from ERCOT for deployment to date according to riot's press release with one gigawatt supposed to come online at the facility the first 400 megawatts are planned for q4 of 2023. That's a huge development. ERCOT is obviously very familiar with Riot because of their Rockdale site, and they seem to be okay embracing them even further. We'll have to keep following the local stuff. Like, I don't really see that getting in the way at all. Like, there's always like your run of the mill local teacher or anti Bitcoin mining group that comes out and doesn't like things, but it has shut down operations in the past up in New York in uh, Niagara Falls. We've definitely seen that play a toll. I don't see that really happening in Texas. Very different place, but definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I, I mean, not everyone loves Bitcoin, right? And not everyone's going to love Bitcoin mining, and it's really loud. Like I, and you know, I remember that just from you know when I was in university trying to run one of my apartment. My roommates were like, "You need to stop that because it is really loud." That being said, in Texas, particularly with this story, we, we know that ERCOT is sort of a free market. 
um, grid. So I think what the locals can sort of be happy about and take solace in is the fact that it's not like um, there's going to run out of power, right? If these facilities take so much power and there's so much demand from them um, and power becomes sort of a scarce resource, it's going to increase the cost of the electricity and then the miners will be priced out of the market. That is the beautiful thing about the economics of Bitcoin mining. This plant could not be economically viable, especially in the conditions of today, if electricity prices get hiked up. We don't know if uh, Riot has um, fixed PPA agreements already set up for, for the long term, right? Um, they may, may be and have a history of having demand response deals with ERCOT. So um, it may be the case that ERCOT pays them to curtail their electricity power um, and actually makes sort of a, a more stable, less volatile price curve for electricity for the, the city of Navarro. So it could potentially be a positive impact for the citizens there. And they just quite don't know it yet. Um, but of course, you're right. Um, we're going to have to continue to monitor sort of uh, the complaints of locals in different areas with mining regions. It'll be interesting, but I think long-term mining is sort of good, a stabilizing force for grids. Um, but we'll come to see that in fruition. Yeah, this reminds me of like 1880s coal strikes and something like that from union labor departments back in the day getting upset about new industries moving to the area and the exploiting workers. I uh, don't really know if that's the case here. It just seems like they're putting up a a big computer site. You don't really hear anybody complain when Google or Amazon moves to town with uh, their hosting services, but Bitcoin mining seems to be a little bit more mm, de- divisive, I should say. Louder. It is definitely <laughs> louder. <laughs> definitely pretty loud. Cool. Well, we'll close it down there. Just four quick headlines to end the week on. Matt, thanks again for joining the pod. See you again next week. Cheers. <laughs>